Hey everybody, welcome to Tuesday, and you'll notice Zelda is with me this Tuesday. So we're talking video games, right? And you like to be a gaming kitty, don't you, Zelda? Yeah, and today I want to talk about why the Yakuza series is just so good and why I'm fascinated by it from a game design perspective, not just liking the game. I actually think the game does some really, game series does some really unique and interesting and good things that I wish more games did. Uh, I realize this is sort of my zone for games and I'm, I'm going to be really, really careful about the difference between, how do I put this? something that is objectively good and something that is just that I like. And I will make the case for something being objectively good as opposed to just being something I like. So, uh, well, Zelda, Zelda steals a pencil. Here's Zelda. Zelda. Yeah, come on. There we, there we go. Yay. Okay, this has turned into a cat hijack video. Come on, Zelda. Okay. Well, Zelda is playing with the pencil. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Or buy a one-time Leanna Cares session for someone who can use it but can't afford it coffee.com slash leanna k all right so zelda's playing with a pencil but i have actual gameplay from yakuza kawami to run over this video because i want to show off the gameplay for people who don't know what yakuza looks like or anything like that um here we go we'll start there we go okay so one of the things i love about the yakuza series is the scope of each game it is an open world ish game but the map is quite small it's one district um you know this is the first few games and uh well no in yakuza zero it's two but you know what i mean the maps are contained you visit most places more than once uh you'll notice there's enough space to beat guys up but you know, it's not this epic sprawl the way you get in a Grand Theft Auto or a Bethesda game or a Sony first party game, though Ghost of Tsushima is another game I will give credit for for the map being big enough without just being huge for the sake of huge. Um, I do think there is such thing as too big both from a game design perspective, from a budget perspective, and just from a sheer enjoyment perspective of the people playing it. You want to feel at home in a world. We've got the leveling system right here. Um, and that's another thing that's cool about this game series is that it really gives you a sense of achievement by leveling often, which is important with something like this that can feel bordering on pointless, but the humor, you know, takes it over. The point is the funny, even if it doesn't advance the main plot. But getting back to that idea of, of hugeness, a person can't feel at home. They can't feel like they really know the world. If it is so vast, you only visit most places once or twice. I don't see the point of having a game where you're supposed to visit and revisit if there's only a point to going to something once. Why not just make it, you know, a tunnel game? Make it a straight up action game, um, even if you don't kick people in the head. And just be honest about what you're making as opposed to, oh, it's open world and there's this great big map. But other than a few key hubs, there's no practical purpose for going back to various areas of the map. Unless they do something like Horizon Forbidden West, where you don't get certain tools, you don't get certain abilities to get into those areas. So it's basically a stick that requires you to go back and forth instead of a carrot. Personally, I think video games should use sticks very, very sparingly. Uh, there are a place for them, but you got to do it consciously because being forced to do things isn't fun being encouraged to do things is fun, right? And that's when we get into Yakuza's combat. People either click with the combat system or they don't. I've talked to a few people who have said, you know, they've beat a ton of From Software games, but the Yakuza combat just does not click with them. Um, even though 
you notice it's like be awesome at fighting combat there are tactics to it that you have to get a feel for the different styles of combat are you know have their places better or worse it takes a while to level um in each game but once you get the hang of it every single one of the forms of combat does have its place and the game is forgiving enough that you can do trial and error to see which forms of combat work best you notice i just switched up here because the rush combat style wasn't working switch to brawler because he's blocking a lot you need those block breaks um but uh, even that's not working so well uh this guy was tougher than i expected him to be but there we go we got some hits in um and then of course you've got somewhat limited inventory somewhat li everything is somewhat limited so everything feels very relatable but nothing is so limited that it becomes really frustrating or really punishing and that's a much tougher balance to get than one would expect now one of the things the yakuza series does is reuses things a lot so and and the um every other game tends to be jank and then they clean it up again so they experiment and fix it experiment and fix it you have to be prepared for that even the janky games like yakuza kiwami here the things that work about it way overwhelm the things that are jank about it and it's the sort of jank you can adjust to as opposed to jank that just hurts the whole time and one of the things getting into narrative now that works so well with the yakuza series is the the main the, the primary main character of kiryu but then the kind of yin and yang that is kiryu and and, and majima um kiryu is a really fascinating video game character he's that man of few words square jawed action hero but he's got this affinity for kids uh he is sort of childlike in ways you don't expect a haircut my um but he is sort of childlike in a way that you wouldn't expect from a guy who settles problems with this fist but it makes him very endearing. What it also does is creates a really interesting dynamic in the dialogue sections. Not only with, you know, Majima's constant taunting of him when they fight over and over and over and over again in Yakuza Kwame, to the point that it's overkill to the point of hilarity, but also because Kiryu is a character that you can play a bunch of different ways. They all make sense precisely because he does have this social awkwardness to him where sometimes you can choose to make a mistake in, in social situations, in dialogue, in a way that makes sense. Yes, you will not get that approval bonus for getting it wrong, but the game gives you enough chances to build relationships with people that sometimes it's worth that loss of you know points in a mini game to get that really funny character moment in storytelling uh i am very impressed by how flexible kiryu is based on the dialogue that's offered and, and that's because it choice models into three options right they only pick things that kiryu might actually say but you don't feel like you're violating the character if you're obtuse or rude in certain circumstances because Kiryu's really not very smart. Um, and that's where this interesting dynamic, the kind of, that's called the Batman and the Joker in, you know, Japanese slapstick with Kiryu and Majima. And it really works. You know, not only does it make their constant, you know, <laughs> fighting each other something you look forward to instead of ah oh, this again but it both 
creates a poignance and doesn't take itself too seriously. Because the interesting about the interesting about Majima is that it juxtaposes sort of a, a homoerotic taunting of Kiryu with an affinity for women in Yakuza Zero that really sort of sets up and and in in <laughs> certain things I won't I won't spoil in subsequent games, um, but it really does set up an explanation for his flamboyance, for the mind games, for not knowing how much is the cray cray and how much is um, scheming and how much he's using the reputation of being you know a mad dog. Um, to hide his true intentions or hide his machinations. I mean, Majima shows a real ability for planning and grand schemes and this, that, the next thing, but he uses the insanity so that people don't know what he's going to do, people don't see him coming, and, and also, I maintain, people underestimate him, and he likes it that way. Uh, and that the, these two character juxtapositions really add to the primary narrative and then the balance between the primary narrative and the side quests. And this is something that divides people as well. The balance and the tone and how the tone swings wildly from the absolute absurd, ridiculous nonsense of Yakuza to the legitimately tear-jerking, gut-punch, emotional, legitimate drama. You end up caring about these goofy characters from the wrong side of the tracks who do morally questionable things, in part because of the goofy, vulnerable moments that they experience in side quests. Now, some people find the change in the tone too jarring. Other people, like myself, really enjoy beating dudes up with potted plants and then feeling the drama and actually caring what happens to characters. And, you know, um, uh, it is hard to predict where the plot of Yakuza games is going, even though it adheres very, very tightly to a lot of film tropes, the cinematic tropes and story tropes of, you know, the martial arts and, and gangster mobster genres. Uh, and that is harder than the game makes it look. I really do think that more of this game was deliberate design than it's given credit for just because it works more often than it than it doesn't and it really shouldn't based on how much is going on here how many risks they take how many tonal shifts there are how many mini games and side options you know scotch tasting this is oddly compelling because it's all real scotches and if, if you're, you know, if you're a Scotch fan, like me, this is really cool because when you have a Scotch you're familiar with, you're like, yeah, they're describing it accurately, they're picturing it accurately. Um, and then, you know, the games that you can and cannot play, uh, there's something really compelling about this, you know, hardcore uh, guy who's been in prison for 10 years being absolutely terrible at bowling. <laughs> you know, um, every little thing informs the experience and informs your relationship with these characters without railroading you into too many choices. Now, it does funnel you in places, but funneling and railroading to me are not the same thing. And yes, you know, it exploits cute children and adorable dogs in places. But they go so all in in cute children and adorable dog moments that um, it, it feels deliberate, and so it doesn't offend uh, uh, offend my intelligence too much. I can laugh with the shtick and the cheese instead of feeling like it just missed the mark. Uh, and the place that this really shines 
in terms of character development, even though the Yakuza games are, you know, focused on Kiryu with a side of Majima, the, the different female characters they bring in, you will not find a larger, more diverse cast in terms of their characters and their interests and their role in society you won't find many games that do it better and that was a real eye-opener to me because not only do they have women of different uh you know sexuality sexual preferences uh you know modesty standards some are brash some are very shy some are nerdy some are rude uh, women are put in peril, women are not plot armored, but they're allowed to be likable and unlikable, funny and dramatic, uh, without feeling like any of them are strong female characters or making a point. They're allowed to be flawed, they're allowed to be nuanced, it really feels like the game treats women as people to the point where you start wondering if a woman who asks for your help on the street is telling you the truth that you can actually tell by certain sides whether she is or not you get to know the different cabaret girls personalities their likes and their dislikes and it feels very meaningful and very immersive and I won't say real because this is a game where a guy beats up groups of people in alleyways while glowing and on fire, you know, and the idea that Kiryu never kills anyone when he pile drives someone into the pavement is absurd. But that's the point. You're allowed to think it's absurd. You're allowed to revel in the absurdity of the over-the-top, like, wrestling-style violence. And yet still connect with the characters on an emotional level. And this is a game, as you can see. Um, it chooses poignance and immersion over realism. The suspension of disbelief this game requires is not for everyone. You have to accept the absurdity. But for some odd reason, the over-the-topness, the superhero, super-villain quality punches up the emotions and for me makes you connect to them more instead of deadening it out or exhausting you in the way something like, you know, the grittiness of The Last of Us 2 or even some of the Witcher games does. Um, the, the lightness, the silliness, the ridiculousness gives you a break from the suffering and the drama so that when you get in to the sad, scary, angering parts, you can actually feel that sadness, fear, and anger, and not worry that the game is going to uh, exhaust you with misery for me. Uh, and again, harder to make work than you might think, especially since you choose uh, sometimes the game does kind of block things off and make you do specific missions, but a lot of the time you can choose when you're going to do quest missions. You can choose when you're going to do side missions, and it all locks together really well in a way that impresses me and, trust me, is a lot harder to do to make um, coherent and feel immersive than they have made it seem here. And they don't always get it perfect. There are some parts where characters are just sort of blocked off like Sims waiting for instructions. And it does feel very gamified. But the modesty of the budget and the scope of the Yakuza games makes that make the games more lovable. Instead of feeling like uh, lazy or um, arrogant. There is a big difference in how much you can forgive on a, a game like this that really reuses assets, um, doesn't 
overdevelop anything in terms of, oh, look, we're going to do this amazing texture on a wall you only see once, right? It is so modest in its scope ambitions that when it goes for the wall and making you feel, you're cheering it on. Uh, you'll forgive the janky gameplay in places. You'll forgive the stuff that's a bit rough because it doesn't look like they're just setting money on fire in terms of graphics and map size and, you know, motion capture and all that stuff. The game is impressive looking for its age. Um, the games uh, are impressive looking for their age, but they're not, you know, Last of Us 2 or Uncharted impressive. And so when you get the little clips, when you get the little bugs, um, in very few are game breaking. I've, I've only had a, a one hang. But when you get those, it's just like, well, okay, yeah, they only had so much money and they needed to make choices and, and they needed to, you know, contain their ambitions. And so you're rooting for it. As opposed to these very, very expensive, um, you know, you, it's the most glaring in many Sony first party games, but, you know, some Bethesda games do it. Um, certain Frostbite Engine games also give you that same feeling of when stuff looks really expensive, every lack of polish, every little lack of polish, every little. It, you know, rough edge stings so much as opposed to something like this where, you know, again, there's a, I, I can't help but use the word, well, modesty is probably the wrong word, humility. There's a humility to some of the decisions. The game feels like it's serving the player like one of the bartenders or waiters in one of the many uh, bars or food establishments around around the district instead of talking down to you or trying to wow you as a glorified tech demo and to me that is the thing that makes everything else this series does so impressive and makes me root for it in a way that i don't cheer on games with bigger budgets uh it feels like an underdog story as well as an underdog development story and that provides an absurd surrealist experience with a level of authenticity that's greater than the sum of its parts so I highly recommend these games, despite them not being for everybody. And the reasons, the reasons people have told me they couldn't get into these games are, are totally, totally valid and I completely understand them. But I love these games. And I like making videos about reasons I like stuff. So this was a video about the reasons I like stuff. Hope you like it. Hope it convinced some of you to play Yakuza. The nice thing is they end up going, the games end up going on sale a lot. So you can get them for like between five to seven dollars, which is really, really cool. Easy on the wallet. Because again, some of those PS5 games, whoo, they're a hundred bucks Canadian with taxes. It stings. So uh, hope you enjoyed this little deep dive into games. Uh, maybe I'll do more of these. Let me know. Um, uh, what you think about this format. I'm trying something a little bit new, but also going back to stuff I used to do before that didn't do well traffic wise. So we'll see. Um, and if you like what you see, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K or buy a one-time Leanna Care session for someone who can use it, but can't afford it. Coffee.com slash Leanna K. Thanks for watching.